Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual. Even with all I know and have learned deep diving into grief, it can still be hard showing up for loved ones who are grieving. So I'm really excited to have discovered Grief Warrior. Sending a Grief Warrior box is a way that friends and loved ones can say, I'm thinking of you and acknowledging your grief. Each box has thoughtfully chosen items, including a journal, anxiety relief essential oil, and so much more. My favorites are the In Morning Badge, letting others know you're in pain without having to say so, and the Ways to Help Notepad, which simplifies asking for help with tasks like laundry or errands without feeling weird for asking for help. The Grief Warrior Box provides healing and comfort, and most importantly, it's a communication from you. Head over to agriefwarrior.com and enter GGG20 for 20% off your purchase of a Grief Warrior box. Check our show notes for more info on Grief Warrior. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness explores the different ways we grieve, the gratitude that allows us to persevere, and the greatness we discover along the way, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Sarah Shaul. Michael Namkung grew up in a home where there was little room for mistakes. A miscalculated action or behavior could invite confrontation. Throughout a childhood punctuated by anger and violence, he learned to wear a mask and suppress his emotions. He came to understand that his own imagination and desires were pretty much unimportant. He didn't know how to feel or how to safely be himself within his family or out in society. His choices were influenced by anxiety and fear, and his goal was to make it through life with minimal adversity. He didn't believe he could ever be happy. As a child, his parents attempted to dissuade him from becoming an artist. He came to believe he didn't have any power, and so possibility was replaced by self-doubt. His drive as an artist was strong, however, and Michael would eventually rebel against the conventionally recognized success his parents wished for him. He earned two master's degrees in education and fine arts and went on to establish himself as a tenure-track professor. But with all this success, Michael was unfulfilled. He came to realize his choices were still influenced by the safe path he'd adopted in his childhood. He felt trapped by his accomplishments and no longer excited about his life, his work, or his relationships. The stress of maintaining the life he'd built made him regularly wish for it all to be over. That's when he began to grieve for the hope and trust he'd left behind as a child. He grieved for the part of himself who wanted to joyfully create and wanted to cry but was never allowed to. Healthy development happens when children explore and take risks, and that requires courage. As parents, we should encourage our children to be bold and try new things, to fail, learn, and keep trying. Sometimes the opposite happens. Fear for our child's well-being and the desire to keep them protected could lead us to discourage our kids from pursuing what interests them, leaving them forever stuck at that stage in development. As a parent who's determined to raise children differently from how I grew up, there's a lot of guesswork involved. Fostering a child's curiosity and interests, I feel, is as essential as simply loving them. I was gifted with a uh quite a lot of time to myself. And in that time, I cultivated an imaginary world or an imagination that was very active and alive. They were hands-off for the most part, and I had that sense of freedom as a child. Like hands-off in the sense that they didn't interfere? Right. They They were not helicopter parents by any means. They were both very busy, and there were three of us, so... I was mostly left to myself to come up with ways to entertain myself or to engage with the world. What about your siblings? Um, Well, my sister was born with a disability, and that's one reason why I had so much time is because she took a lot of my mother's attention. My younger brother also 
we both, I mean, one of my fondest memories is playing with him, actually playing games, wrestling with him, running around, you know, behind wherever we lived and picking up sticks and playing sword fighting and things like that. I always remember my mother telling me I could do whatever I wanted to in my life. I could be whoever I wanted to be. So I have two boys. The youngest always wants to be with the oldest. So when you're describing this like alone time that you're able to, that that really fostered your creativity, I'm just thinking there's no way that would happen in my house because my older son has no no privacy. <laughs> He's always got this little brother. Mm-hmm. Was that anything like that for you? We were a pair. We were playmates. So I guess when I say alone time, I mean alone from my parents. Gotcha. I was very often with him. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But at the same time, your parents were dissuading you from, well, once you, I imagine you got to an age where you're like, okay, this is what I want to do. Yes. Well, what was that like? Yeah. Well, I had wanted to be an artist from as long as I can remember. And I remember being lots, wanting to be lots of different things. I remember wanting to be a garbage man, a mail carrier, a cartoonist. But the most persistent one was being an artist or being a professional soccer player. Actually, those are the two things I wanted the most. But there was one day that I remember my parents sat me down to tell me that I think I was upper elementary or maybe I just started middle school, that I needed to start focusing on my life and practical things. And the message is pretty much that being an artist wasn't a real thing. Like people don't actually decide to do that and that you have to be a genius and you have to be really lucky and you'll be poor. And there's all these, all these messages. Oh, like you have to be lucky to like make it as an artist. Is yeah. That, yeah. And so if, yeah, you're going to be a starving artist if that's what you're going to choose to do. Yes. But the genius part, what is, oh, you have to be a genius of an artist. Yes. Ah, I see. Yeah. And even then, if you get recognized at all, it'll be after you die. And so they just, we're making a very clear case for why I should pick something to focus on that would bring me more an assured security or stable life. But you did pursue it. You did. Well, no, I mean, at, they they were effective. They convinced me to give it up. Oh. Um, internally, I didn't, but externally, I began to tell myself that, well, actually, when I say that, so that part of me never really died, but yeah. I did start neglecting that part of myself, you know, focusing on, okay, what's, what are the ways that I can live in this world? How can I succeed? And let me, maybe I should be following the advice of others more than uh, following a dream. I see. But you did become, I mean, you eventually became a professor of art. Yeah. It wasn't until I was an adult when I felt this stirring in me. And I remember pretty vividly being in my late twenties, feeling like my time was almost up to, you know, make a decision about, or to make a change. From what to what? I was teaching middle school social studies. And actually, while I was doing that, I got my accreditation to teach art. And so I started teaching art. And actually, that was a one little spark that got me curious again about my own. Had you been making art up until that point? Or had you kind of put that? Secretly. I mean, not secretly, but just in a very casual, not yeah. serious way. Once yeah. in a while I would draw something or yeah, make something, but not in a way that I thought was going anywhere or even that enjoyable. It was it was enjoyable in that it felt good to do it, but not in that it uh it didn't feel like it belonged. That's what I mean. I mean, was that conversation that your parents had with you did would it kind of intrude upon your art making sessions like, oh Yes. Yeah, this is going to push me towards that. Well, it it intruded on it in a way that I see, that I've seen young artists and young art students deal with that in that the things that they make are always being subject to the opinions of others. They're always Mm. being put out and asked, what do you think about this? Yeah. And that kind of energy behind that creative expression is, it lacks the inner power that it, that birthed the desire to make it in the first place. Right, right. Like, why does it even have to have a 
why does it even have to have a value beyond its inherent need to have been made to begin with? Right. Well, the ironic thing is that if you have that, if you can own that value to create something in the first place, that's the thing that gives it value. It's not in seeking that value outside right. for, from someone else. I'm really curious about how you were able to simultaneously feel disempowered, but externally, once you, you know, skipping ahead, because I know you were a professor of art and you had received accolades and you were an accomplished artist, right? So it felt like an internal conflict all the time growing up and into my adulthood. And as an artist, as an, as a, an artist that was getting recognized and establishing a reputation and a, a career path and, and was having a lot of success, I, I felt both free in that I had found this voice of self-expression that felt good and true and liberating. At the same time, when I stepped out of my making space or my creative space and went to interact with the world, whether that's through my career or through an exhibition or talk, just simply talking about my work with someone else, I found it difficult to stand in the power of it. Grief can be isolating and community is essential to explore, survive, and heal with grief. I co-facilitate the Pause, Breathe, Restore retreats, where we help people engage and move forward with grief in a safe, supportive, and healing community. Our next grief retreat will be held at the Oregon Coast March 5th through 8th. Information about this retreat can be found at pausebreatherestore.com and in our show notes. Something had to give, right? Eventually something gave, where emotionally you had a, I mean, did you have an epiphany or what? what? Yes, I had a realization that I was not fully making my work for myself. Mm. And I had this feeling going for a few years where I would start to get inspired by the work of other artists and I would start to think, oh, I want to start doing something like that. That's really, looks really fun and interesting. But then there's this other voice in me that said, but hold on, you're this kind of artist and you're moving in this direction and you're on this tenure track line and you're supposed to prove that you know what you're talking about in this specific field that you were hired in. And so stay there and focus there. The longer I sat in that conversation of myself, the more dissatisfied I felt, the more lost I felt and felt further and further away from the basic desire to create that I started with. And so I realized that I was getting further away from that, that um, internal drive, that internal satisfaction. Right, right. So how did that like manifest? It actually manifested most clearly when I was making my mid, what's it called? My mid tenure review case. Yeah. And I was listing out all the things that showed that I was moving in the right direction. And it was an intricate exercise in listing out all the evidence for my relevancy and as an artist yeah. for my work. Sure. When I got the letter back saying that I was on the, on the right track, that was actually the kind of knife in the heart for me. Really? Because I'd, I'd gone that far and I'd lost. Well, I didn't know who I was anymore. Yeah. And I could sort of see the end of that road and being unhappy, as more unhappy than I was. So, and it was also a, getting woken up by some emotions that I hadn't previously recognized that were dormant in me and that were, that I began to connect where the power of my work came from. And where was it? It was in my desire to make something I'd never seen before, something I hadn't felt before, something that was different from my experience and not having to fit my work or myself into some box or some category. I know you you shared with me that you felt this emotional rage. When did that present itself? Or had it always been there? It had always been there, but I hadn't really been aware of it. Yeah. You know, I think men learn at an early age as boys that, our emotions are something we suppress. And even though there's a sense of we feel it in there, we call it stress. We call it, mm. I'm having, I'm stressed out, I'm busy, oh, you know, yeah. and I don't have time for. Yeah, yeah, sure. And you, so you think that's a cultural thing. You don't think that's so much something that happened within your home. You think that's. I think it's both. Yeah. Yeah. Both. It, it was taught directly in my home and also supported by the culture. Got it. Yeah. 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 The first time I, 
consciously notice the rage was when my children were young, kind of toddler age. And I began to observe myself getting angry because yeah. I had had this belief that I was not an angry person. Right. And I didn't recognize it until then that I had developed some very sophisticated coping skills to suppress my anger mm. for decades. So to suppress rather than address. Right. Mm. And so I would, they were very young when they were, I don't know, tantruming about something or protesting or fighting with each other. Yeah. Fight, they're fighting with each, with each other is the thing that actually continues to be the thing that brings this up for me. Yeah. And I started noticing myself getting, like raising my voice at them or feeling actually this desire to strike out in my body, come through me, that flash through my body. And I began to feel my, the presence of my father yeah. in me. And because I'd always thought of myself as someone who's calm and patient and I can handle anything. And um, when I became a parent, I said to myself, I'm going to be such a great dad. I'm not going to be angry and impatient and like my father was in, in my experience of my own childhood. When that showed up, I realized that I was asleep to myself in more ways than I kind of even knew at the time. I mean, I was to find out later how much more things there was to, for me to learn, but I, I became aware that I was not who I thought I was. Yeah. You must have been scary. <laughs> it was. It but, was because it was, it was really ungrounding. And I felt like I had this voice inside of me that remembered the fun and freedom and playfulness and joy that I felt as a child right? and how far away that felt. But it, I, there's a part of me that remembered that and that voice became almost in a moment that I can remember specifically the only voice that I could trust. Like I couldn't trust any other voice, include, especially my own, yeah. my, my own sort of mind ruminations about what I thought who I was or what I thought life was about and definitely not the voices of others. And it was scary to, at that time, to kind of say, I don't know who I am. I'm willing to find out. I mean, I'm no therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist, but I am I am very fascinated by this idea of leaving behind, like the gr your grief of grieving the child, the child that you left behind. And it makes perfect sense to me that having children of your own would trigger that. Yeah. It was definitely their presence that allowed me to see that in myself. I mean, and I'm so grateful for them for that reason. And I continue to be because they keep showing me these parts of myself that I really had forgotten. You hear your parents say this, but it's really true that you do relive your childhood yeah. through them. And we have a choice to either embrace that new discovery or to become the parents that we had. Ah. Right. And it's not to say that it's only one or the other. It's right. always a kind of negotiation between those things. But my children continue to be my greatest teachers because of what they allow me to see in myself. Something we don't always talk about with grief is how financially vulnerable we can be. That's why it's important to have someone on your team that you can trust. My financial planner, Leslie Tyzak at Edward Jones, is that person. She looks at what is important to me when helping with everything from managing budgets, cash flow, and where to invest and save. I got to know her when I was setting up my kids' college savings accounts. She is someone I can count on to help me and my kids optimize our resources to make the best choices when it comes to preparing for our futures. Schedule a meeting with Leslie to talk about your goals. Her contact info is in the show notes. It was a big leap into the unknown. I just knew that what I was doing wasn't working and I had to stop what I was doing. Not really knowing what was next, but trusting that whatever I was to learn, I was ready to learn it. I'd taken a, another leap earlier just to even claim myself as an artist when, I, when that whole journey first started and 
in finding my voice there, I wanted to integrate these parts of myself that felt disparate. I've always been an athlete. I've always played team sports and I've always had this creative drive. And I realized as I was starting to study art, started to learn how to draw, that the feeling that I had when drawing was similar, very similar to the feeling I had when training in my body. Interesting. They were both this state of flow, this both, both the state of being feeling at one with my surroundings and with what I was observing and both embodied. I kind of just jammed those two things together. I said, well, what are all the different things I do in athletics? What are all the different ways that I draw tools and materials, environments, situations, protocols, and just threw them into a bowl and see and mixed them together and pulled things out and see what would happen there. And that was a really liberating time to first find this voice that was coming through my own experience of life and the things I was making were these combinations of various combinations of art things and drawing things together. What was like one of the first iterations of you bringing these two together? It's one of the ones that I do in my my show is a wall sit drawing and it's basically so a wall sit is a exercise where you you put your back against the wall your legs are at a 90 degree angle and you stay there for well, in my case, I do it for as long as possible. So until fatigue, and then I'm drawing on the wall behind me with my hands. Yeah. But it's not something I can see. It's something I can feel and hear and feel through my body. Interesting. Yeah, you're not looking at that wall behind you while you're drawing. Right. That's and so, wild. And so in that sense, it's um, touching back to that place where we first learned to make marks as very small human beings, where we're not making them because of how they look. We're making right. them because of how they feel and how right. they feel moving through us. Right. Yeah. That's right. When you watch a child just like scribble all over the walls. Yeah. That was the beginning of learning to trust something in me that felt integrative. And that's the same kind of desire I drew upon when I was making this a leap, leap away from, from a stable art career was to say that there's these other energies that I was now feeling coming in that I felt were compartmentalized. And I wanted to bring these emotions that I was just becoming aware of and re-familiarizing myself with into the work. And that's what birthed this desire to work with poetry and work with the emotions that come through that kind of language and give my imagination and give my artwork a new kind of more embodied voice. Right. But you don't call yourself a performance artist, but it, to me, it, it feels like performance art. Would you accept that? Or, sure. Yeah, or I'll, I'll call myself that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Or is there something else that you refer to yourself as? Or, is, or do you not want to be pigeonholed into one kind of, do you not, how do you feel about labels? It's interesting because as I was learning how to be very careful with my words, when I was first beginning to describe my work and place my work within a specific art historical context or cultural context so that others would understand it, that's when I began to kind of develop my skills as a wordsmith, but in a way that was, it was for others. As many artists are, I've been very, very resistant to labels, but I've also learned about the power of words and what a word can carry. And so I like labels a lot more than I used to like them now, because when chosen thoughtfully, they can really tell something that's not the norm or that's not the conventional way of using a word. So it's not even necessarily in the labels and how we use them. There's always a way in which categorizing and compartmentalizing into these under these labels is confining and constricting, but I think it's on us as creators to use the words that feel, for lack of a better word, just right in our bodies. Mm. Because when we own those, no matter what the words actually are, they work. One, one of the labels that I, that I had a hard time owning for a long time was artist. Right. Even it took lots of external evidence to show me that I was an artist before I was finally able to say, I guess I am an artist because it was something that I told myself I couldn't be or that wasn't allowed or wasn't valuable or that I didn't know how to do it until I achieved a certain, I don't know, stature or status or whatever it was. 
But when I decided to write poetry, I mean, I didn't really decide to write poetry. I was moved by some poetry and I began writing it because it was a way for me to feel my soul. And I didn't have any problem calling myself a poet, even though I have no training in it, other than I listen to it and read it and I'm learning as I go. But I know that there's a truth in that right. and the way that it feels in my body. Something that people have been telling me about the show when they see it is how vulnerable I am or they're inspired by that level of vulnerability. And it strikes me every time to take that in because all I'm really being is as truthful and honest as I can. And if vulnerability means honesty and truth, then the strength, the way that we think about vulnerability not being like standing up and being strong and confident, right. actually means hiding and falsehood. Well, isn't that the key though? I mean, there's one thing to be truthful, but to be be outwardly, I mean, some people would say, oh, the gosh, that person's just wearing their heart out on their sleeve. There's this belief that we can share too much in that, right? And what does that mean to share too much? Does it mean that if I share too much, I'm going to be hurt? I'm going to be too exposed? Or does it mean if I share too much that I'm not secure in who I am? Like, I'm, there's a different energy in both of those, but I think it's more about real power and real integrity and real strength. I would say all those kind of those concepts fit together in the same kind of energy are being able to stand in all of that unknown, all of that fear or pain or grief and honor it and allow it and allow it to be seen. And when you come from that point of view, there's no that idea of oversharing doesn't even make sense. It's just sharing what's real and what's authentic. So do you feel like you've hit the sweet spot? Or is there some, is there more work to be done? Or and, and my other question is like where where does that grief of that child left behind sit with where you are now? I like that question because the, the child that I left behind is now with me all the time. And so he comes up with me on stage. You know, he's right here with me now. And there is a sweetness to it. And that does feel like a sweet spot, too. It feels like it's a place where I'm integrated with him. But I'm also not him. I'm also an adult who's making, moving in the world. But with a space for him to be with his joy, with his laughter and also with his fears so when he's feeling when there's that part of me that still feels afraid to say something or afraid to express something or just afraid to be seen he's there grief gratitude and greatness was created by me sarah shaul and is a production of recursive delete audiovisual in portland oregon this episode was produced and edited by jack saturn with music by Samantha Jensen. Subscribe to our show wherever you listen to podcasts. Word of mouth helps us find new listeners, so please leave us a review and let your friends know about us. More information about this episode and how to contact us can be found in our show notes and at griefgratitudegreatness.com. You'll also find links to follow us on Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. Join us next time. We look forward to sharing more conversations with you.